Just northwest of Chicago lies the quiet, affluent suburb of Barrington. In the early 80s, many of its citizens relied on the First National Bank of Barrington to keep their money and valuables safe. But all that changed on Saturday, April 11, 1981, as the unsuspecting bank staff prepared to lock down the vault for the weekend. What they have to go through to secure the vault on Saturday afternoon is they have to calculate the amount of time between the time they're going to close the vault and the time they want the vault to open. Once the vault door is closed, there's nothing outside of the vault that would allow you to bypass that. The safe deposit vault at the First National Bank of Barrington was on a time lock, and it was set to be opened at 7.30 on Monday morning. But on Monday morning, customers and staff at the bank had a shock waiting for them. When the vault attendant and the customer first walked into the vault, everything appeared to be normal. Everything appeared to be in order. There was no indication whatsoever that a serious crime had been committed. The bank attendant put her key in the box. The customer put her key in the box. And both the cylinder locks fell into the box. Employees quickly discovered that 74 safety deposit boxes had been emptied. And you see the large steel gates and the big steel vault door. You don't think this is incredible. You think this is impossible. The FBI determined that $1.1 million in jewelry and cash were missing. There was very little physical evidence found at the crime scene. What they did discover was a number of mysterious clues, including a soda bottle filled with urine and an alarm clock. The FBI agents and the police did everything within their investigative power to determine who had committed this burglary. But with the lack of physical evidence, the authorities couldn't even determine how the vault was penetrated. The burglary at the First National Bank of Barrington was unsolved. There were no leads. This was the perfect crime. This criminal masterpiece was the work of local hairdresser, William Smardo. William Smardo was a hairdresser by day and a bank burglar over the weekend. Probably the most brilliant burglar in the country. He was a legitimate hairdresser very bright man, probably wasn't as challenged by being a hairdresser. And so he came up with his plan to loot the safety deposit box area at a bank. The first step in Smarto's amazing plan is to enlist the help of his brother Vincent to case potential targets. In casing the banks, they, they were looking for banks which were located in wealthy areas where there was likely to be a lot of gold and jewelry and so forth and cash in the safety deposit boxes. At the First National Bank of Barrington, they find just what they're looking for. Smarto's next step is to familiarize himself with the staff's routines. He had a very disarming way about him. He could walk in and he could chat with the bank employees and put them at ease, and he came back frequently. He got on a first-name basis with them. He and his brother had rented a box at the Barrington Bank under a false name. And they would go in there together, two of them, and they would uh, schmooze the vault attendant. They would watch when he or she took a break. They would note times uh, when the vault area was unattended. As his brother flirts with the vault attendant, Smarto confirms that he can slip out of the vault area unnoticed. He realized that no one checks on when someone leaves the vault. They just check on when you come in. What Mr. Smarto did was, you know, cased it from the human angle, which is an entirely different uh, set of skills than what a burglar would usually use. For his ingenious plan to succeed, Smarto must find a way to plant the tools he'll need for the robbery in the vault. His solution is to hide them in his rented deposit boxes. And he would, one by one, plant the tools he would need. He had to have done this one tool at a time. But when the tools and equipment outgrow the deposit boxes, 
Smarto has a solution. His modus operandi was to tell uh, the people that uh, he uh, dealt in art so he could bring in large objects. William Smarto also determined that the vault had a false ceiling where he could conceal his burglary tools prior to the burglary. Smarto now uses a piece of plywood to create a secure shelf for his remaining equipment. And he had in the false ceiling all his equipment, food, a water bottle, even an empty water bottle, which he could use to urinate in. With all his tools in place, Smarto tackles the alarm system. The sound sensor was to protect the vault walls, ceiling, and floor from someone jackhammering into the side or the ceiling or the floor in order to get into the vault. Although Smarto isn't planning on going through the wall, ceiling, or floor, he still must neutralize the alarm for his plan to work. He knew enough about electronics to discreetly disable the alarms. Smarto somehow learned that all you had to do to cripple that system was to punch a hole in the sound accumulator. And he did that with a long screwdriver. But Smarto goes further. To ensure he's found all the sensors, he uses an old-fashioned alarm clock. He would set it to ring, and he would secrete it in a false ceiling. And uh, then he would wait outside the bank. And when the alarm rang, he would wait to see if the police reacted to the noise in the bank. If he had disabled the alarm system, there would be no response. And the police responded, didn't see anything amiss, and they left. After taking out the remaining alarms, Smarto is now ready to strike. But how can he break into the deposit boxes in plain sight? This is where he displays his true genius. He makes himself disappear, revealing the most important reason he's chosen the Barrington Bank. They needed to find a bank that had a dead spot in the corner. In other words, the two rows of safety deposit boxes came together in the corner of the room, and there was a square empty space down there. Where the rows of the safety deposit boxes meet in the corner, there was a, an area that was void or vacant. And it was probably two feet by two feet. Smarto had to shimmy up into the corner on top of the row of boxes and slide down into the square space in the corner. And he was going to hide there. And the vault attendant obviously didn't notice that uh, two people had come in, but only one left. The bank closed on Saturday. The vault area was locked. William Smarto hid in that corner until the vault was closed. The time lock on the vault meant that it could not be opened again until 7.30 on Monday morning. Locked in the vault, Smarto waits an hour to make sure everyone has left the bank. He climbed out of his corner spot, took all his tools down from above the false ceiling, turned his flashlights on, started pounding out all of the cylinder locks. To do this, Smarto uses a specially modified stove bolt. The stove bolts were custom cut to the diameter of the lock. The exact resizing of the bolt is critical. It must line up perfectly with the cylinder lock, so Smarto can punch it through without causing surface damage to the door. The trick was to do it in such a manner that he could reconstruct the front of the lock and put it back in there so as to not give away the fact that the crime had been perpetrated. There were a lot of gold coins, a lot of jewelry, a lot of cash in these boxes. It had to be physically very taxing to pound out with the hammer and chisel all of these cylinder locks. That's 150 cylinder locks, and you have to pound pretty hard to do it. It's nerve-wracking work. Any visible damage will be fatal to his plan. Though he's on an absolute deadline, Smarto still takes meal breaks. He also finds time for charity. He fancied himself as a Robin Hood, so he 
thought he could tell by the contents in some of the vaults, whether they were mortgage records or college payments, that some of the people were a little short. So some of the goods that he couldn't take, he put back in other uh, vaults. He spent a lot of extra time and effort putting things back together. In each case, he would clean up the metal shavings on the floor, remove the contents of the box, and put everything back together so that it appeared normal. It would take a tremendous amount of meticulous work on his part, because anything that he did in there had to be undone, because he did not want to be detected the next morning when they opened the vault. On Monday morning after looting 75 boxes, Smarto has only minutes to make sure the vault looks pristine. He stashed his various tools again above the false ceiling, climbed back into the corner. The most astonishing part of this caper, to me, was how he got out on Monday morning. That morning, the bank opens for business, and the attendant arrives to unlock the vault. Once they get the combinations unlocked, then they throw the handle, and the vault door comes open. Everything appears normal. Smarto now uses a dentist's mirror to monitor the room. After watching the attendant leave, he emerges, disguised as a workman. The bank had some construction going on at the time, which probably accounts for his decision to, to do this. And he had duplicated the clothing that those workmen wore. He calmly walked out of the vault and out of the bank with his loot unobserved. Monday morning, Vincent was there to be able to pick him up. But Smarto's stolen so much loot, he can't carry it all in one trip. Once he had taken out the first two duffel bags full of loot and put them in a car, then he went back in to get the other two. It took nerves of steel. William Smarto has scored over a million dollars in the most ingenious and distinctive vault heist in US history. The only problem is, it turns out to be too distinctive. William Smarto has pulled off the most amazing bank vault heist in U.S. history, walking off with $1.1 million in cash and jewels. So the FBI agents uh, conducted a thorough search. They dusted for fingerprints. They photographed the scene tried to inventory all the tools they had found above the false ceiling. The FBI agents were just astonished by the uh, complexity of the planning and the brilliance that was involved. The alarm clock mystified us for a while until we realized how the sound accumulators worked and how they were disabled. Ultimately, during the course of the search, they found holes in each of the sound accumulators. The FBI uh, concluded that it had been a job that had been planned ahead by individuals who had uh, rented safe deposit boxes at the bank and had accessed the bank repeatedly prior to the burglary. We know that he had a safe deposit box here in Barrington, and he used an alias of the last name was Zito. The FBI uh, inspected the signature cards at the First National Bank of Barrington and determined that all but two involved real people. But even with this evidence, the trail goes cold. It was an open case, an unsolved crime. And there are a number of those out there. And you wait, uh, you wait for a break. And the break comes one year later, in another bank, in another wealthy Chicago suburb. William Smarto was ultimately discovered in an almost comical way. At the bank in Lake Forest, one day, an elderly customer walked into the men's bathroom. And while the customer was in the men's room, a, a tile from the ceiling fell down. And the janitor actually got a ladder and went up there and poked his flashlight around in the false ceiling, and he saw a leg there moving. The police were called and they brought William Smarto 
down out of the ceiling and arrested him. Lo and behold, that was Bill Smarto, hiding above the false ceiling, over the men's room, adjacent to the vault area. The, the vault area is searched above the false ceiling. They found very similar tools, very similar uh, materials that were found in the Barrington Bank. When the authorities investigate Smarto, they find further evidence suggesting he's a lot more than just a hairdresser. The FBI bank squad, they do cross-check, and they really checked all over the world for similar MOs. They uncover a case in another Chicago suburb, where a bank janitor interrupted a man attempting to drill his way into the vault. Smarto, clever person he was, looked a janitor right in the eye and said, when I'm through, I hope somebody's going to clean this up. Smarto, at that point, didn't take any chances. He just got his, his stuff together and just got out of there as quickly as he could. But of course, that janitor identified him as being in the bank. After searching the bank, the police discover an alarm clock hidden in the vault's false ceiling. With the eyewitness account and similar MOs at three Chicago area banks implicating Smarto, the authorities charge him with the Barrington burglary. The, the fact that this was so unique actually helped us because there's not a second Bill Smarto out there anywhere. I mean, there's only one person who could do all of this, and I think that was pretty clear. William Smarto is found guilty and sentenced to 20 years. Due to ill health, his brother is never brought to trial. After the trial was over, I told William Smartle if he made restitution of the goods that he had taken, that I would consider reducing his sentence. At that point, he was uh, still claiming that he was innocent, and of course, he wouldn't have any of the loot. Looking down the barrel of a 20-year sentence, Smarto changes his tune. What happened was a duffel bag of uh, goods was mysteriously brought to his attorneys. When, when I saw the bag, I was astonished. It was soaking wet, it was smelly, it clearly had been sitting in a river or a lake. Uh, the, we opened the bag, and we saw the contents, tarnished jewelry, tarnished gold chains. Having returned the loot, Smarto's sentence is reduced from 20 to eight years. But the reduction comes with a unique demand. As a condition of probation, I required that uh, when he got out of the penitentiary, he work with both the FBI and bank authorities to tell them in detail how he committed the crime and help them improve the security of banks so that that kind of crime wouldn't occur again. And he was willing to do that. Because of William Smarto, the architecture of bank vaults has changed forever. No longer are there false ceilings and all corner dead spaces have been eliminated. This case was a great story. It had everything. A criminal mastermind, a criminal genius had pulled off what nearly was a perfect crime. This is a classic case because of the audacity with which the crime was committed, because of the cleverness with which the crime was committed. Uh, the level of sophistication, the thought that went into this, uh, and on top of that, uh, the man himself appeared to be just an everyday person that most people would like in their everyday encounters. It seemed almost to be a game to smart on, to see if he could get away with this. And he thought it through and planned it. I thought it was a very compelling case. Now, Smarto was one of the last of the modern criminals that you really wanted to root for because he was that clever, that charming, and with the Robin Hood aspect of uh, what he did with some of his loot, he was a very attractive character, but a criminal nonetheless.